Roger's, Roger's the star of the show and uh, needs to be seen and everybody can see Roger. So what I wanted to say, because I think this is a, such an important event if we want to understand our future, is that for many years, I would argue, Roger Burroughs has been well ahead of the game. In 2005, he was actually running the ESRC programme called eSociety, which really now means digital and, and everything like that, and was, was working on these issues well before uh, many, many people. He's also applied digital analysis to health, to urban issues, to cities in particular, and to methods. So if there's any academics out there, his paper on the H index in the sociological review is stunning for the way it captured how performance is being measured across various different sites. Roger is currently um, Professor of Cities at Newcastle University. He was the PVC at Goldsmiths for interdisciplinary studies and we don't have time to go through all the different places he's worked, all the different books he's written and the numerous research grants he's had and all the articles he's written, but do look him up because he really is, yeah, yeah, really ahead of the game of things like geodemographics. He's going to speak for an hour um, and we'll record that lecture and then we'll have questions that Michael will curate. He's got fantastic visuals and good videos and I asked Roger if we needed a trigger warning and he said in a way yes because a lot of this stuff is really quite terrifying in terms of where our future could head and so be prepared that it's it's not <laughs> it's really not going to be a story of hope and wonder um, and all the nice things that we do. It is a story of a very dystopic future that's heading towards more and more inequality. So, Roger, I hope that's OK as an introduction. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Bev. Um, at the moment, I can just see you, Michael. Is that correct? So now I can see Bev. Is that what I need to see? And can people hear me OK? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm just going to send your slides live now, Roger, so okay. the, uh, the participants can see your slides. OK. And we'll take questions in chat. Yes, yeah, so the question and answer is, uh, is, is on, so please do feel free to, to do them at any stage and we'll get towards them at the end. Yeah, great. OK, so can you see the slides now? Can yes. You, can you see me? Well, but unfortunately, the joy that is Microsoft Teams means we'll not be able to have both of them at the same time. Ah. So I can I can alternate between you and your slides if oh, you no, like. No, as long as I know it's just the slides, that, that's fine. And we can, we can come when we come to the Q and A's. I can I can I can appear. Okay, so just just interrupt me if, if anything goes awry because this is a bit of a weird experience for a Zoom person, sort of staring into the PowerPoint rather than seeing people's faces and their reactions. So it is, it is, Roger. Sorry. No, it's all right. I'm used to seeing people holding their heads in their hand and. <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> it's probably better this way. All right. Shall I start? Yes, that would be. Are you recording? Yes, it's been recorded. Great, lovely. Yep. Do start, please. OK, well, this talk then is based on a paper uh, co-authored with um, a colleague uh, now at Sheffield called Harrison Smith in the um, special issue of Theory, Culture and Society on post-neoliberalism. Um, the version I'm going to give you today is kind of an updated version. I've called it on Neo Reaction and its software. Uh, and I want to tell you a story about these four individuals. Um, uh, the uh, Neo Reactionary or NRX luminaries they're a strange brew, uh, base Deleuzeans, what I'm going to call techno fogies and billionaire libertarians. I'm going to focus on the connections between uh, someone called Mencius Mulbug, uh, otherwise known as Curtis Yarvin, uh, his bank roller, uh, the infamous Peter Thiel, uh, Nick Land, who might well be known to some of the people uh, uh, here today, and Patrick Friedman, who, uh, as we'll see, is part of the, the Friedman uh, uh, dynasty. Uh, Rose and Milton Friedman are his uh, grandparents and David Friedman, his, his father. Um, Neo-reaction, NRX for short, 
is, uh, as I've said, a strange brew of, of uh, French social theory, uh, libertarian ideology, uh, racism, misogyny, and uh, a particular predilection for a, a certain kind of, of libertarianism, obsessed with uh, exit, obsessed with exit for reasons that will become clear uh, in a moment. It's also associated with some ideas that we can talk about if we've got time, that again, people might be familiar with, uh, to do with debates around accelerationism and especially right accelerationism. I haven't I haven't foregrounded that, but the space at the end of people want to talk about the relationship between uh, neo reactionaries and uh, accelerationism. Um, if you're interested in trying to map out uh, where neo reactionary ideas sit in the melange of of of, of uh, 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 hatred and uh, 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 reactionary forces that, 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 that creates the alt-right. And this lovely paper by Anne Betke uh, tries to map out and tries to grid exactly where neo-reaction or what we might in a moment call the dark enlightenment sits uh, within uh, that typology of, 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 of hatred. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, a strange range of sometimes disparate uh, uh, resources and sources that, that have, have come to form this, this uh, strange uh, 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 position, uh, a kind of an alt social theory, if I could call it that, of, of, of neo-reaction, uh, that's gonna range all the way from uh, Hirschman's classic exit voice and loyalty through the science fiction worlds of Snow Crash with Neil Stevenson, through Jacob Rees-Mogg's father's, uh, William Rees-Mogg's The Sovereign Individual, to ideas around seasteading uh, and also to do with libertarian ideas associated with uh, Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, the blockchain and the idea that increasingly cities should be run as businesses, as corporations. Uh, some of you might have seen uh, the recent attempt uh, uh, within Nevada uh, for permission to build a new crypto smart city. So a really strange combination of unfamiliar uh, resources uh, that we need to draw upon in order to come to terms with uh, neo-reactionary uh, ideas, uh, which uh, uh, are instantiated, I'm going to argue, within various attempts to kind of prototype some of those theoretical ideas within the context of, of both engineering, uh, but also in relation to the development of software as well. Uh, but we'll come to that as we as we progress. Right, uh, at the heart of this, uh, these four individuals, uh, uh, Curtis Yarvin, Mencius Mulbug, Nick Land, Peter Thiel, and Patrick Friedman. I wanna try and uh, uh, understand the links between uh, these four uh, individuals, some of whom have met, some of whom uh, have never met. Uh, and at the key, at the heart of all of this, is a, 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 a concern about uh, democracy and the idea that democracy is done. The idea that democratic forms of governance uh, now function as a fetter within neo-reactionary thought, uh, as, as, as a process which undermines the forms of uncompensated capitalism uh, that, they, that they desire. In, in the writings of both Yarvin, Mulbug and Nick Land, they both point towards a key essay, an infamous essay by Thiel from 2009, which was published in Cato Unbound, the house journal of the Cato Institute in Washington, founded by the libertarian billionaire Charles Koch, in which he infamously declares that, quote, I no longer believe that freedom and democracy are compatible. Uh, and as we'll see, Thiel uh, is now an incredibly influential figure uh, uh, globally uh, and has recently won some major contracts uh, to analyze uh, NHS uh, data uh, within his company, Palantir. I no longer believe that freedom and democracy are compatible. Land, uh, of course, or I say of course, but if you're not familiar with his work, uh, then you soon will be. Uh, Nick Land, uh, in uh, his uh, 30,000 word treatise in 2012, The Dark Enlightenment goes further, suggesting that democracy is not merely doomed, it's doom itself. For him, democratic political forms involve, quote, cropping out all high frequency feedback mechanisms such as market signals and replacing them with sluggish infrared loops that pass through a centralized forum of general will. A radically democratized society insulates parasitism from what it does, transforming local, painfully dysfunctional, intolerable and thus urgently corrected behavior 
uh, behavior patterns into global numbed and chronic socio-political pathologies. Democracy is not compatible in Land and Yarvin's world with the forms of uncompensated capitalism that they, that they desire. The neo-reactionary's alternative to uh, 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 democratic forms is first to retire all government employees, rage as they call it, in order to reboot the economy and second to replace democratic institutions with a C CEO or even a monarch. They're interested in the idea that we should organize ourselves around GovCorps, societies run like businesses that can be regulated not via the voice of its citizenry, not by democratic means, because there will be no democracy in their model, but via our ability to exit as consumers in a free market for governance, a form of post neoliberalism that takes the logic of the market to, they would say, its logical conclusion to actually dissolve the state so that we form a market, a market for governance itself. And, and they're interested in how we might begin to do that. Land in particular has become obsessed with the ideas contained in the classic work of Albert Hirschman on the distinction between exit voice and loyalty. The land, democratic voice and the warm solidarities of loyalty must be opposed as they will, uh, as we saw above, uh, cut out all high frequency feedback mechanisms or market mechanisms uh, uh, using a uh, different, uh, more, 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 more accurate terminology, I would say. For Yarvin or Mulbug, any attempt to engage politically through voice would be ineffective, even futile, because of what he's come to term the pervasive error that monopolizes civic and political discourse. Designing new architectures of exit becomes of paramount importance for the neo-reactionaries. Indeed, for land, quoting Patrick Friedman, free exit is so important that it is now the only universal human right. Now, neo-reactionary NRX associated with these four, but most closely associated with Mulbug uh, and, and land, uh, really comes to, to uh, prominence uh, within uh, around about 2014, 2015. And this is a particularly nice paper by uh, Park McDougald. Uh, the darkness before the all, uh, where he, he points out that it's hard to take seriously something with such a silly name, and neo-reaction is no exception. He says, at first glance, when you read this material, it appears little more than a fever swamp of feudal misogynists, racist programmers, and fascist teenage dungeon masters gathering on subreddits to await the collapse of Western civilization. Neo-reactionary or NRX, or as we'll see in a moment, uh, in Land's terminology, the Dark Enlightenment, combines all the awful things you always suspected about libertarianism with odds and ends from pickup artist culture, Victorian social Darwinism, and an only semi-ironic attachment to absolutism. Insofar as neo-reactionaries have a political project, it is to dissolve the US, Europe, any nation state, into competing authoritarian seasteads on the model of Singapore. They're nebbish Nazis with Bitcoin wallets and they're practically begging to be shoved in a locker, says uh, McDougall. But the political project is to try and think about ways that we can use mechanisms of exit to provide a market for governance. Now, approaching neo-reactionary thinking just a few years ago might have been a mildly diverting exercise. A chance, as Elizabeth Sander, uh, Sanderford puts it, to connect some philosophical ideas using some very silly right wing nut jobs who were nevertheless interesting. That's in her book, Neo Reaction, uh, a Basilisk. But post 2016, as Sanderford expresses it in her own intimate style, everything went to shit. And suddenly, these otherwise batshit crazy ideas, associated software projects, and social prototyping experiments began to manifest across a whole range of global, cultural, political and technological imaginaries. It's hard to fathom that NRX thinking now forms a significant part of the theoretical universe that contemporary political figures and, and what we might call proto-theorists such as Cummings in the UK and Bannon in the US draw upon and are attempting to promulgate into mainstream political discourse. As Angela Nagel explains it, supporters of NRX seem also to have read Gramsci and heeding the ideas of Gramsci's theory of hegemony, especially via social media, uh, they've been very, very effective in the promulgation 
of some of these core ideas uh, within a, a, a particularly influential social, cultural, political and technological spaces. So let me just take you through some of these characters. Let's begin with Yarvin uh, Mencius Mulbug, uh, who uh, from uh, about 2006 uh, onwards uh, produced this blog, Unqualified Reservations, uh, uh, an open letter to open-minded uh, progressives. A whole range of, of discourses uh, based upon uh, a, a, a complex amalgam of, of libertarian ideas and really premised upon the old uh, uh, matrix distinction between red pills and blue pills. He believes this discourse produces uh, red pills. Uh, we within the academy, within what he calls the cathedral, uh, our job is to produce uh, blue pills. The other day, he says at the beginning of his blog, I was tinkering around in my garage and I decided to build an ideology. He's an engineer, he's a computer programmer. He orientates within a clear computationalist ontology. He's interested in seeing social processes as an engineering problem, essentially. His basic idea is that as the crappy governments we inherited from history are smashed, that they should be replaced by a global spider web of tens, even hundreds of thousands of sovereign independent mini countries, each governed by its own joint stock corporation without regard to the residents' opinions. If residents don't like their government, they can and should move. The design is all about exit, no voice no democracy. Democracy is slow. It numbs the processes that are required for speedy resolutions to uh, uh, societal issues. We have to generate processes and new architectures of exit which will allow for a new market of governance systems. Linked to this is his concern with uh, the blue pill. If his red pill is to be successful, we have to find ways in the erection where he say, of generating new forms of culture war, which actually begin to undermine what they see as uh, uh, progressivism. Progressivism has become a veritable religion, uh, uh, Molbug says, of quack government. Its policies are always counterintuitive. It preaches leniency as the cure for crime, timidity as military genius, plopocracy as the acme of economics, special education as the heart of pedagogy, indulgence as oversight, appeasement as diplomacy, and so on. Anti-egalitarian, anti-democratic, pro-market, anti-welfare. Now, Nick Land, it might be more familiar to some of you. Nick Land in 1994, and I'll take you through a little timeline of his, his emergence and his development for those people who are interested. Um, he was uh, a core celeb based uh, at that time at the University of Warwick. He, he produced uh, a heady mixture of, of jungle music and fetamine drugs and uh, a, a way of writing that began to introduce uh, Deleuze, Manuel Delanda, and especially the science fiction writing of, of William Gibson to new audiences. Um, but at the same time, and it was always present, uh, always present, um, he was also interested in Hayek, von Mises and the cybernetics of, of Wiener to the extent that Benjamin Noyes uh, called him uh, a Thatcherite Deleuzean. But this is Nick Land talking in 1994 uh, from a documentary, a very uh, uh, early documentary from Adam Curtis called Visions of Heaven and Hell. And this is Nick Land in 1994 uh, suggesting something which now seems very mundane but in a time when we were only just getting used to the internet and we were still uh, interested in, in the way in which bureaucratic systems uh, worked, uh, uh, seemed quite radical and quite kind of um, uh, alluring at the time. So I hope you can hear this. This is Nick Land in 1994. There is a very similar pattern that you find in the structure of societies, in the structure of companies and in the structure of computers and all three are moving in the same direction that is away from a top-down structure of a central command system giving the system instructions about how to behave towards a system that is parallel that is flat which is a web and which change moves from the bottom up and this is going to happen across all institutions and technical devices it's the way they work 
OK, so that was Nick Land in 1994. This is the timeline for anyone who's interested in his, 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 his development. Uh, and that period was when he was working uh, within the Cybernetic Culture Research Unit, uh, CCRU, at the University of Warwick, which had been established by Sadie Plant, who is another writer people might be, uh, might be familiar with. Um, uh, and uh, these are the kind of books that were being produced at that, that, that time. Uh, the collected works of, of land, such as they are, uh, are in uh, 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 collected writings, 87 to 2007, banged nomina, um, uh, which uh, 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 allegedly uh, Cummings is, is a big fan of, but we'll, we'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Uh, but infamously, infamously, uh, land uh, for, for reasons that you can read about in the Renegade Academy piece um, ends up above a body sh the body shop in Leamington Spa after he gets booted off campus for, for various uh, uh, misde misdemeanors. Uh, and uh, he leaves Warwick in 1998. Um, one of my interests in land is a personal one uh, because around about that time, um, uh, Mike Featherston and I published uh, an edited collection called Cyberspace, Cyber Bodies and Cyberpunk, uh, uh, which doesn't, hasn't aged well, I would say. Uh, but it does con con contain two essays, one by Land, Meat, or How to Kill Oedipus in Cyberspace, another one by Sadie Plant, The Future Looms, Weaving Women and Cybernetics. What interests me, however, is the continuity of the ideas of Land's uh, 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 theoretical treatise from that period to the present, and to actually ask the question whether there is a disjuncture or whether the sorts of things he was arguing then in the language of the time, in a Deleuzean, Guattarian discourse, uh, was always saying the same things as he's saying, saying today. What then happens is that, that Land, uh, with his partner Anna Greenspan and their two kids, uh, end up, uh, first of all, in Taiwan and then Shanghai. They set up two presses, uh, Spiral Time and Urbatomony, uh, Urban Atomy, uh, and uh, become uh, writers about China and tourism, uh, including the production of this uh, huge text, uh, the Shanghai Expo Guide of 2010. Uh, and at some point during this period, land begins to read Mulbug. And what happens is that, that he produces a series of blog posts and then this long 30,000 word codification of Mulbug's unqualified reservations, which he publishes as the Dark Enlightenment and becomes a kind of Deleuzean inflected guide to Mulbug. And how it happened is a really, really interesting theoretical question. And it's at that point that, that, that kind of land memes and Landian ideas and the kind of the conflation of Mulbug and land turn into uh, what had been called neo chimeralism into neo-reaction, into the Dark Enlightenment. And the Dark Enlightenment becomes this much read uh, 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 document which tries to codify uh, Mulbug's uh, basic, basic thesis. And then uh, since then, um, a, a series of books, a series of, 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 of novellas uh, uh, accused by uh, some readers of being kind of Lovecraftian, uh, which means that they're also racist neo-fascist uh, treaties. Uh, and a book not not written by Land, but written by his partner Anna Greenspan, uh, which nevertheless codifies uh, some of their ideas about about uh, neo China. Uh, that's, uh, uh, for instance, a footnote in Shanghai Future Modernity Remade. Footnote six: A state in the acknowledgments. Nick Land's my partner. I quote him extensively since we developed much of the thinking that went into this book uh, together. So, if you want a kind of a more traditional introduction to some of those ideas. Uh, that that text is a good place to start. Uh, Land is incredibly influential and 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 was uh, important in the education of many uh, progressives, uh, many musicians, uh, many artists, many philosophers, and many of our colleagues uh, from Goldsmiths. Uh, 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 for for those of you who are familiar with that with that institution, I'm not saying for one moment that any of these people now align themselves with with his ideas. Uh, quite the opposite, uh, and indeed. Uh, uh, the rise of, uh, of, of, of the, the, the second coming of Nick Land is sometimes associated with the popularity of Mark Fisher uh, and, and uh, uh, Land is sometimes portrayed as the, as the, as the kind of the, 
the negative dialectic of 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 of, of, of Fisher's uh, Fisher's uh, uh, ideas, but nevertheless uh, a very in, in, influential figure, uh, including um, um, uh, uh, people like uh, Harry Kunzro, who's just published a new novel uh, called Red Pill, which is uh, clearly uh, not not uh, unassociated with his experience uh, there. Some of you might be familiar with uh, Code Nine uh, and um, uh, his music. Um, and uh, his, his record label, uh, most especially the music of Burial. Uh, and some of you might be familiar with Jack and Dinos Chapman, uh, who indeed provide some of the cover art for some of Land's, uh, Land's books. Uh, uh, Land now, however, is now uh, publishing uh, books about cryptocurrency and the philosophy of, of cryptocurrency, but he's also become a meme. And I don't think this is just inconsequential. Landian memes have become incredibly important uh, and here's just one, I won't play it all, but this is a, a land meme from uh, uh, available uh, from your nearest YouTube shop. He's all right. And for the international. <laughs> It goes on for a while. Um, Paul Gilroy, in a brilliant paper, has, has recently tried to characterize these two strange characters, Yarvin and Nick Land. This alt-right substrat draws upon the dubious legacies of thinkers like Bataille and Schmidt, as well as a techno-orientalist sublime discovered in the exciting possibility that states will be shrunk down to minimal proportions and run as corporations. This dream is larded with a gleeful anti-humanism and a fervent racism, now routinely and blandly redescribed as human biodiversity and ethno-nationalism. Uh, the would-be mag magi of this movement are led online by the failed academic philosopher Nick Land and others who have in turn been influenced by Mencius Mulbug, a prominent techno fogey who draws inspiration from some of the more obscure works penned by Victorian theorists of imperial domination. Beautiful writing. Now the third figure in this uh, 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 quartet is, is Patre Friedman. Uh, Patre Friedman was a uh, was uh, uh, as we'll see comes from that Friedman uh, dynasty of of, of neoliberal uh, economics. Uh, he was also a, uh, a, a engineer and a, and a and a computer scientist at Google, uh, but then uh, received some funding from Peter Thiel to establish a prototype of some neo reactionary ideas uh, and founded uh, with the help of Thiel um, uh, 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 the Seasteading Institute. The idea of building a, a libertarian nation, an architecture of exit that would allow for neo reactionary ideas for the governance of uh, or market and governance uh, to be uh, facilitated. And in his book written by uh, Joe Kirk called Seasteading, um, uh, we have a kind of a characterization, a, a polite characterization of what is at stake here. David Friedman, Patre's father, described a machinery of freedom. Milton Friedman, his grandfather, advocated the freedom to choose. Patre identified a machinery of freedom to choose, a machinery of freedom to choose. He proposed an idea that became contagious. Imagine 10,000 homesteads on the sea, seasteads, where ocean pioneers will be free to experiment with new societies. Aquatic citizens could live in modular pods that can detach at any time and sail to uh, join another floating city, compelling ocean governments to compete for mobile citizens. A market of competing governance, uh, governments would allow the best ideas for governments to emerge peacefully, unleashing unimaginable progress. By such means, an economic and moral argument could become a technological experiment. And that, that, that paragraph, in a sense, embodies the heart of neo-reactionary thinking. How can we develop a dynamic geography that's not constrained by distance, by geography, by territory, that allows people 
to exit systems of governance to actually moderate and calibrate the way in which uh, we are subject to uh, 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 sovereign rules outside of a nation state, outside of democratic systems of governance. Can we invoke an architecture of exit that uses the only human right, the ability to exit as a means to uh, establish uh, voluntary uh, collectivities uh, which essentially then uh, regulate uh, how we're how we're governed. And here's some visualizations of what they imagine uh, seasteads uh, will uh, look like. Uh, and for those of you who have seen the documentary about seasteading available on YouTube, again, unfortunately, they don't look anything uh, like that at all. Uh, they uh, are, are uh, uh, for the most part, um, uh, engineering uh, architectural failures. Indeed, uh, in a lovely paper by Steenberg et al, uh, Atlas Swan is called, they report on uh, uh, their observations of a conference hosted by Teal in 2009, uh, where the seasteaders were meeting and they, they characterize it like this. The tenor ranged from that of a science fiction convention, potential seasteaders in attendance who were overwhelmingly men, wondered what, what they could do to attract women to live on seasteads. Uh, then there was a seminar in libertarian economics with references to Friedman, Hayek, Olson, Ayn Rand, to a scientific meeting on ocean engineering. Architectural renderings were displayed and critiqued. Then there was a psychedelic conclave of free thinking anarchists. Indeed, the entire seasteading venture might easily be written off as an impractical fantasy of social misfits and political dreamers who would like to make their own states, who would like to make their own states. And of course, that is the case. We're not going to have seasteads uh, anytime soon. But what has changed in recent years is that those dreaming of creating their own states are now greater in number and have more political and institutional support for their aspiration. Enclave libertarian ideas, including the work of the Startup Cities Institute, are now supported by the late likes of the Cato Institute, the Mises Institute, the Foundation for uh, Economic Education, the Montpellier Society, as well as Silicon Valley and other billionaires and political strategists who have been red pilled. Libertarian billionaires with the resources who have been taken in and have succumbed to these ideas. Uh, many of them, of course, trying at the very uh, moment that we're speaking uh, to uh, go and uh, 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 explore out of space and develop colonies uh, on Mars. I, I kid you not. However, and this is the central point, neo-reactionary ideas are all about dreaming of a certain kind. This process is central to the neo-reactionary hegemonic strategy. Steinbeck and colleagues intuited very early that seasteads would not be established anytime soon. Their purpose was to reflect on the limits of freedom imposed by the state so that others will dream up and implement more practical alternatives. Their ways of thinking about how we can develop architectures of exit. Now, this is a cultural and political strategy uh, which has come to be known after, after land and indeed after Mark Fisher, but after land as a notion of hyperstition. The notion that has long been central to, to land's thinking. For land, time, like much else, is non-linear, and thus relations between cause and effect are always complex. Futurity is in the here and now in the sense that it is not something that just unfolds, it's something we create. On occasions, portended social imaginaries, designs, diagrams, fictions, maps, movies, plans, philosophies, prototypes, theories, dreams, and more, become generative for the future. It is, Land says, as if the tentacles of future entities reach back through time in order to bring into being the very elements necessary for their own materialization. As Haider, in a brilliant, brilliant paper, which I'll, I'll return to at the very end, explains, there doesn't exist a, a simple word for this cause and effect in ordinary English, but Land coined one, a hyperstition, that which is equiposed between fiction uh, and technology. And then there's a quote from Land there that I won't, I won't uh, repeat. But hyperstition, fictional entities that make themselves real, is central to hegemonic thinking and hegemonic strategizing within neo-reactionary neo thought. The fictional social imaginaries offered up in movies like Metropolis or Blade Runner, in the novels such as Atlas Shrugged or Gibson's Neuromancer, or 
or especially in the case of NRX, uh, Neil Stevenson's snow crash, are all examples of hyperstition. But so too are broader discursive assemblages that come to function as ideologies. And, and uh, uh, Friedman's seasteading adventures could be thought of in this way. They're not real, they're not practicable, but they provide a kind of a, a, a sense of what might be possible in the future that might bring into being a different world. And indeed, uh, some people have argued that Lang's uh, hyper-reflexive attempt in the dark enlightenment is, 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 is itself an attempt to construct a hyperstitional object, fictional entities that uh, themselves uh, uh, force themselves in, in, into existence. However, it's Yarvin that we need to return to if we're interested in this notion of hyperstition, because although his blog is clearly foundational to neo-reactionary thinking, he's also a software engineer. He's also a coder. And at the same time as he was writing his blog, he was also writing code. Yarvin has been working on a piece of software called Urbit since 2002. And in 2013, uh, 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 he was, uh, as he was running down his blog, he launched the San Francisco based company, Talon Corp, which oversees Urbit with funding from Teal's uh, venture capital arm, uh, the Founders Fund. Now, Yarvin's parted company uh, with uh, Talon in uh, January 2019, but he still evidently has some intellectual and financial interest in the development of Urbit. It could be, of course, that the development of NRX ideas and Yarvin's ability to write code are completely separate practices. But this seems unlikely, uh, as, ha as uh, Hayder uh, says in, in, in the paper that I'm going to mention at the end, there's already good evidence to suggest that neo-reactionary ideas are being instantiated with other pieces of software. And in this regard, it is not clear why Urbit should be any different. And anyway, Yarvin has occasionally hinted at ties between his ideology and his professional pursuit, even producing a very brief uh, Molbug post called Urbit Functional Programming from Scratch pointing to uh, the post towards uh, an, another written by a good friend himself, C. Guy Yarvin. But there are other stronger hints at this hyperstitious quality uh, within, within Urbit. Um, uh, Toulon, Bukabar, Orbis and, and Tetius, uh, which is the Borges story, which Yarvin's company uh, takes uh, its name from, Toulon, describes a secret society, Orbis Tetius, that architects an entirely new world. Uh, for those of you who have read the novel, Toulon, uh, by publishing an encyclopedia describing it, creates that world. Over time, bits of this fictional world begin to emerge in the real world, consuming it such that the world will be Toulon. Seasteading and Urbit function as hyperstitious entities. They're trying to will themselves into existence by providing kind of fictional entities uh, uh, that, 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 that are tied up with this, this, this sense of, of, of a complex futurity. Seasteading and Urbit have a similar structure. They both provide architectures of exit for neo-reactionary thinking, one in terms of engineering and a geography, a dynamic geography of the ability to move uh, and, and therefore to exit from particular territorial configurations. And Urbit, a kind of a virtual concomitant of that, the possibility of creating a virtual city in the cloud. <laughs> Let me just kind of summarize where we are about what I see as being dark enlightenment ideal types, if you, if you want. What are the key themes? Well, it seems to me that there are three things that they oppose and three things that they advocate for, or which they see in positive terms. They oppose three things, fundamentally. They oppose democracy. Uh, they think we should uh, uh, engage in, in, in rage, retiring all government employees and appoint a CEO or a monarch, they're monarchists. They believe that states and cities should be run by business people or by kings and queens. They don't believe in equality. They believe equality is a myth. They believe in human biodiversity and what Land calls hyper-racism. They believe that we've become embroiled in forms of political correctness uh, which they would say it's our job within the academy in particular to perpetuate through uh, the uh, production of blue pills. They oppose what they call the cathedral, a self-organizing ideological alliance of elite abstract thinkers, academics, the media, government, business, engines of abstract ideas about justice, democracy, universalism, and so on. 
So they want to attack elites, liberals, political correctness uh, and academia. They are some of the main funders of the culture wars. They're some of the main people undermining the contemporary system of universities. They see, and we see it okay, in, 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 in post-Brexit UK politics, they see universities in particular as being sites for the perpetuation of a range of ideologies that oppose uncom un uncompensated forms of capitalism, that advocate for democracy. Uh, and and uh, it, it, it's tied in. Some of you might be familiar with this intervention, this piece of performance by this, this group around academic grievance studies, where they managed to get a range of papers published in mainstream humanities journals uh, based upon ideas that were essentially often fascistic, but writing about them in a, in a Deleuzean inflected Foucauldian manner in, in order to demonstrate, as they would see it, uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 her heretical nature of contemporary academia. So they're opposed to democracy. They don't believe in equality. They're strongly uh, uh, engaged in, in 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 the idea of of experimentation with uh, uh, um, uh, bi biological forms of of, of 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 intervention, and they want to attack the cathedral. What are they in favour of? They're in favour of developing architectures which emphasise exit, but not voice. They're interested in new state, uh, new patchwork state forms based upon models that derive from science fiction novels like Snow Crash. They're interested in the emergence of hyperstitions like seasteading, like city states, like urbit, like gated communities, like the notion of off world worlds uh, that we might be familiar uh, uh, with from, from uh, Blade Runner and so on. They are also um, advocates for the singularity. They're obsessed with artificial intelligence, with automation, with the idea of post-humanism. And the models they point towards are anti-democratic seasteads. Essentially, Hong Kong, but maybe Hong Kong is no longer a good example given what's happening there. Uh, but Singapore and what they call Neo-China, city-states that are not democratic, but which are technologically advanced, that, that are seen to work well and is tied up with a whole range of issues to do with smart city uh, technologies. But the key thing, the key thing is technologies and engineering solutions which will facilitate markets in governance. Now, uh, I don't know how much time we've got, but I'd just like to, to give you this little uh, video summary of, of the position from land from a few years ago. So we'll see how far we get. I know we might be running out of time, but let's just, just have a, the, the initial part of this presentation from land and you can you can hear it all if you're interested. Greetings ultimate exit people. This is a new thing for me as most things are for everybody these days. It's all part of learning to inhabit the net. You all have a t-shirt right? This is the retro Cold War flavoured version. A quick and basically irrelevant nostalgia term. We owe the exit voice distinction to this man. Here's the crucial book. The third term tends to go missing. Perhaps that's because it seems to be inherently morally coercive. I'm going to assume people here are thick skinned enough to take it. The principal differential of the 21st century ideological spectrum will be loyalty. It will divide those at the extremes who invoke loyalty to various large scale social collectives as the supreme political value from those professing or simply demonstrating minimal sensitivity to this appeal. While tempting and in certain respects plausible to map this spectrum back onto an ideological polarity stretching from radical collectivists to radical individualists much is missed by doing so. The disloyalists have their own model of collectivity, biased to the commercial ideal of the exchange and to the technological ideal of virtual connectivity. The opportunity for frictionless switching within a global network or network of networks epitomizes disloyalty. As a positive techno-commercial achievement and networks are collectivities. 
The distinction between the politics of loyalty and its other is more productively drawn between hot and cold collectivities. Hot collectivities are based on passionate attachment. Cold collectivities are based on pragmatic calculations. Hot collectivists have motherlands and fatherlands. Cold collectivists shop around. Loyalty in this ideological sense is essentially a macro social phenomenon. Disloyalists are probably no less loyal to their families, friends and dogs, although they are quite likely of smaller and more highly nucleated families, more carefully selected friends and cats or lizards rather than dogs. There are discussion to be had about differential rates of divorce and parental abandonment within this spectrum, and we, become, and we can be confident that the loyalist social conservative constituency will ensure such a discussion takes place. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, there's another five or six minutes, but if you want a, a, a pithy and very disturbing summary of the Landian Mulbug position around exit voice and loyalty, that's a good place uh, to go. I'm going to end with um, Yarvin's development of Urbit, this virtual concomitant of seasteading, a virtual city in the cloud. What I'm going to argue is possibly not a viable future for the internet, but nevertheless a, a hyperstitious object that might well try and will itself into existence in, in other, other, other ways. Urbit is not alone in attempting to do what it's attempting to do. The importance of owning and managing one's own personal server and the need to reinvent network protocols to correspond with emerging socio-technical needs are now also apparent uh, elsewhere uh, within much uh, uh, mainstream thinking. Platforms such as Blockstack, Sandstorm and Solid, a decentralised platform under development by Sir Tim Berners-Lee's company Inrupt, all represent different approaches to this reinvention of various systems of re-decentralization to correspond with emergent data control prerogatives for what some speculate will be the next generation of web applications and services. Urbit, written by Yarvin, uh, funded by Teal, attempts to secure peer-to-peer -peer networks of personal servers built on a clean slate system software stack that replaces multiple developer hosted web services on, on multiple foreign servers with multiple self-hosted applications on one personal server. It is the Western answer to WeChat, they say, but without the surveillance. Global computing platforms complete with its own programming language, protocols, operating system and digital identity, but without the, the surveillance of what Urbit calls Megacorp, Google, Facebook, Amazon and so on. They see Urbit as being a departure from what is now ancient Unix uh, programming and HTTP protocols that are not sustainable for 21st century decentralized applications, blockchains in particular. They want it to be a form of calm computing. The project runs on about 50,000 lines of code over three layers, Arvo, Azimuth and Aegean, uh, a decentralized uh, uh, system. They see it as being a form of digital sovereignty for the 21st century. Urbit's core purpose is to give us uh, all back our privacy and our autonomy. It's time for humanity to control its tools rather than the other way around, they say in the advertising blurb. Getting an Urbit ID should feel exciting, like getting a brand new identity in a new world. Urbit ID is a short four syllable name like Ravmel Rockdill that you own with an eight syllable master pass key. You don't have to remember numbers, passwords. You, you, have a new, you have a new word. The multi-pass is both a driver's license and a credit card. It's both identity and money, a civilization key for the new society. Indeed, there's even urban sigils on the right, inspired from a variety of historical and cultural resources, including William Gibson's uh, uh, first novel in the peripheral uh, trilogy, the, the, the peripheral. You uh, don't just have a, a, a four syllable name, you also have a unique identifier to enter the world of Urbit. A new uh, cryptographic uh, land, uh, which as I say, uh, has, has great similarities with the ideas behind seasteading. In the blurb again, it says if Bitcoin is money and Ethereum is law, 
Urba is land, a digital republic, property, sovereignty and value, finite planets, the users, the stars, the infrastructure, the galaxies, the system of governance. Authority in the system is proportional to urbit property owned. Space as embedded within an instrumentless logic, a tool for being. Visions of urbit as a necessary land to build self-governing virtual cities. A way of allowing people to exit and to decide to form uh, collectivities with people not restricted by nationhood or territory. You can exist within the same space but belong to a different system of virtual governance by choice. This is not a democratic system, it's a system ruled by mechanisms engineered to facilitate exit. Dynamic geographies, rather like within the seasteading vision. A vast archipelago of hypercultures, a centralist network, a centerless network of networks on top of a neutral arvo and azimuth infrastructure, they say. Planets can freely join and exit different stars and galaxies, especially if they disagree with the governance of a galaxy. This is all about this book from 1997, Sovereign Individualism, James Dale Davidson and Lord William Rees Mogg, the father of Jacob. The idea here in this hyperstitious book, not a book about prediction, but a kind of a guidebook for what the, uh, the super wealthy uh, libertarians have been doing over the last three decades. This is a technology, a set of ideas which facilitates the idea of sovereign individualism, a techno utopian right libertarianism, a form of politics that in Europe we haven't really had to countenance. It's been an American phenomenon that suddenly has been inserted within our culture in ways I don't think many of us expected. Urbit provides us with vivid imaginaries of such a post neoliberal uh, future where exit is the only political right. Exit is the only political right. Cyberspace, as they called it back then, is seen as the ultimate offshore jurisdiction. And even in 1997, they begin to talk about the necessity for the blockchain, the necessity for cryptocurrencies, a way of attempting to circumnavigate taxation at the level of uh, sovereign states. They, they, they talk about the triumph of efficacy over power, where IT outpaces the speed of existing authorities, where tax collection is rendered impossible due to the migration of all commerce online. We're there. The current debates seem to me to be about this, the whole uh, advocacy by these people, by these people of blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies is all about the re of sovereign governance by these forms of patchwork architectures. Hyperstition, the importance of cultural analysis, uh, the, the whole idea, as, as uh, Alistair Campbell uh, wrote in his blog, that this was the most important book that none of us read because it wasn't written for us in 1997. But interestingly, if you go to the bibliography, they'd read Mike Featherston, they'd read David Harvey, they understood the ideas within Snow Crash. Indeed, the book is sometimes described as, as Snow Crash with footnotes. It's a vision of sovereign individualism and the ideas about the technologies that would be required to form essentially uh, neo-reactionary forms of, of global global governance. I'm going to end now. Uh, 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 there's more if people are interested about the relationship between all this shit and accelerationist uh, ideas, but I want to end with this paper by Hayda, one of the best papers I've read for many years. It's called The Darkness at the End of the Tunnel, Artificial Intelligence and Neo-Reaction. And it's a, it's a paper about many things, but essentially it's about the way in which this Silicon Valley ideologies and the ideas of neo-reactionaries have become instantiated within the very software that we use uh, today. If the builders of technology are transmitting their values into machinery, this makes the culture of Silicon Valley a matter of more widespread consequence. You might have seen this image from the recent Adam Curtis uh, documentary about uh, Deep Dream. The idea that if you train an AI to see the world in terms of dog faces, uh, it's still there. It's still instantiated. The center of uh, that the image of Sien the inside of Siena Cathedral uh, has is seen in terms of the images of dogs. Is seen in terms of the images of urbit, of seasteading, of neo reaction. 
embedded within the software uh, that we're all we're all using. And of course, here we go. The reality, the mundane reality of the social policy. Just the fact that Cummings uh, uses lots of these ideas within his blog is not really the issue. The idea is that Peter Thiel is here. Palantir is here. These ideas are with us. And just this week, unless you have already signed to say you don't want this to happen, your health data is moving into this sphere. Whether it will be processed by Urbit, I can't say, but it will certainly be processed by people who foreground exit over democracy, who don't believe in equality and probably believe in the singularity and white supremacy. I think it's a scary prospect. We are uh, dealing with techno fogies who are fascists. Uh, and I think it's time to uh, uh, probably leave it, leave it there. Uh, the paper is based upon in TCS, special issue on post neoliberalisms in case anyone's interested. The paper is called Software, Sovereignty and the Post Neoliberal Politics of Exit. I'll leave it there for now. Beth. Wow. <laughs>